Okay, I'm Dave Chambers, and uh, I'm glad to see you here. This is the American College of Dentists Ethics Report program on the new uh, profession. Um, I have a little problem with this presentation. First of all, you're the wrong audience. Um, the people who need to hear this thing about ethics are not the people like you who are the most ethical in the profession. Another little problem I have is that ethics takes place in the dental office. It doesn't take place in a lecture hall or a Zoom conference and so forth. And uh, the third uh, restriction is that I'm not going to tell you what to do. That isn't how ethics works. And then there's the matter of the um, conflict of interest statement. This is required for all these courses. Now, I've been giving ethics presentations for 20 years or longer, and no company has ever approached me saying they have some money to support that kind of thing. So there's no conflicts of interest here. Uh, that's a picture of the book, The Ethics Report, New Professionalism, that the American College of Dentists put together. It's uh, 500 pages long, but we'll do the short version here. Um, the project started five years ago when the Board of Regents of the college said to the editor, we'd like to have a book-length report on ethics in dentistry, and we want it data-based, like Guy's did with his report. Um, we also want it to be positive in the sense of looking for opportunities to elevate the ethics in the profession. And some people got behind that. One person in particular is the late Jerome Miller. And he was so passionate about it, he said, I'll give you a million dollars if you find a million dollars among the others in the uh, college who are interested in ethics. And we did. And that tells everybody that this is very important to the college. Dr. Miller always used to say, have you got a little skin in the game? And that's what he was referring to. And so we're going to talk in the next hour about getting some skin in the game. Um, the approach that we took with the project was to listen. We started by listening and we continued to listen. And we listened to everybody except possibly a few we didn't listen to experts very much. Um, we did literature searches, primarily in professional ethics and organizational ethics. And we did research studies, uh, about 11 of them. And these were published in peer-reviewed journals. You can read them there. And the intent of the project was to diagnose what the problem is. You can read 510 pages, and you won't find a single recommendation in there. It's not about asking other people to help us. It's about saying, what is the problem and how, what are we going to do to fix it? So here's the conclusions of the presentation. The context of dentistry is changing more rapidly than dentistry is responding to that. Training individual dentists in ethical theory is fine, but it's not enough. And the profession has to respond with action and as a profession. Here's the plan for the presentation we're uh, doing now. We've just been oriented. We're going to talk about the listening we did. We're going to talk about what it means to practice dentistry. Uh, some of the things that, uh, that dentists do in terms of ethical behavior four approaches to being ethical, and then how we might proceed. So uh, Stephen Covey uh, popularized a, a common story that we tell. Uh, and he, it's about a, a patient whose eyesight began to fail. And the patient went to the, the optometrist and said, Doctor, I can't see quite as well as I, uh, I used to. And the optometrist immediately reached inside the desk drawer in front of him and he pulled out a pair of glasses and handed it to the patient and says, here, try these. And the patient says, well, wait a minute, doctor, aren't you going to do some tests? Aren't you going to find out what special problems I have and so forth? And 
the optometrist says, oh, no, don't worry about that sort of stuff. These glasses work great for me. So we listened. And we listened to a lot of people in focus groups around the country. We had eight groups of patients, California, Ohio, uh, North Carolina, and Oklahoma. And these were put together by the Citizens Advocacy Council. And that's a group in Washington, D.C. that represents state boards in various professions. We had four groups of practitioners, about two-thirds of each group being ADA uh, members. We had professional leaders in the various states, and these were selected by organized dentistry itself. We had some opinion leaders like AARP folks in Washington, D.C., and we filled in with some uh, written surveys. Um, the question we asked in each case was this. When, we, when you hear the words ethics and dentistry together, what do you think? Now, that was the only question we asked. We didn't say, well, do you think this and do you think that and how many percent are this? We just asked that one question and it wrote down everything people said for about an hour and a half in, in each group. And the number one concern was over-treatment. That wasn't just among patients. That was among the leaders in the profession. It was among the uh, uh, policy makers and so forth. The number two concern is outside values. People outside of dentistry are telling dentists what they ought to do, and some of them are listening. And the number three issue is that individuals practice solo. They practice independently. Now, this is my favorite because uh, the very first session I was in was with some young leaders uh, that the uh, association in Ohio said these are the people who are up and coming. And we asked the question, and the first response was, well, dentists are in, uh, independent. And I said, yeah, I know they're independent, but we wanted an ethical issue. Now, surprisingly, the whole room erupted and says, you're not listening. Being independent is an ethical issue. If dentists don't agree with each other and tell patients different things, if they don't agree with each other and bad, bad mouth each other, who are we going to believe? And if dentists want to hide in their own offices, how are we going to make them more ethical? A couple of things that didn't show up. Poor quality dental care was not an ethical issue. Not one person mentioned it. Dentists don't understand ethical theory. It's not an issue. Not one person mentioned it. Young dentists are unethical, and it's not too much of an issue. Some of the older dentists did say that. So, the self-image. What is the practice? What is licensure? How do people cheat? And so forth. Dentistry is a practice in what is called a professional services firm. Uh, dentists don't add value to the uh, community by selling things. They don't sell toothpaste. They don't go out and discover things like oil refiners do. They don't lecture to people and give them, you know, charge them for uh, their opinion and so forth. Dentists practice, and that's a technical term. The Greek word is techne. And it means the combination of art and craft. Art and craft. Dentists are, the work the dentists do is skilled work. Other people can't do it. It's customized work. It's different for each patient. It's problem solving. Uh, it's not always done the same way. But it is done to standards. And dentistry is only done when people need it. Um, people don't say, well, you know, I got some free time this afternoon. I think I'll go get an endo. They wait until there's a problem, and then they go and ask for that problem to be attended to. And you can't uh, run up an inventory in uh, dentistry. You can't do 20 crowns this week because you might need a few extras next week. There's an asymmetry of information where the dentist knows a heck of a lot more about what's going on than the uh, patient does. And there's direct contact. 
I can remember early on a dental student one asked, once asked me, Doctor, should I touch my patient? And I thought for a minute, and I said, I hope you do. Um, relationships, it's not about a transaction. It's about what went on before, what's going to go on in the future, and so forth. There is no one best treatment for any individual patient. There's a range. And in that range, all of them are appropriate. Uh, but the range is not unlimited. Uh, you have to do dentistry that's acceptable to your peers, or there's a bigger range if you wanted to do it, uh, anything that's legal, or there's a smaller range if you wanted to do anything supported by evidence-based dentistry. But professional services firms are licensed by states, different licensure in different states. They're not licensed by dental schools. They're not licensed by the profession. They're licensed by states. And the state says you can have an economic opportunity to serve the public. And these licenses go to uh, real estate agents and building contractors, anybody who, uh, where the public can't tell uh, exactly what's going on with the professional services firm. The professional services firm, some of them are good and some of them are bad, um, but surprisingly, quality is not the issue. Quality is assumed. Every patient we talked to said, well, I go to the dentist because I know the dentist can do the work. That isn't the issue. In fact, the uh, ADA says uh, you'd better not tell a patient that uh, the, the guy isn't uh, up to quality. Uh, we don't compete on price in professional service uh, firms. If you compete on price, you are going to go to the lowest common denominator and you'll drive your colleagues to the lowest common denominator as well. And we don't compete on size. There's great little ones and great uh, big ones as well. But what does make a professional services firm effective? One reason is they delegate. You delegate to the lowest paid person who is capable of performing the work. You offload as much as you can of the fixed costs like uh, buildings and uh, uh, payroll and that sort of stuff, and you automate your records as much as you can. All of those things are going to add to the value for the dentist and for the patient. Now, here's a funny thing. If, you, if each of you told me how many auxiliaries you have in your office. I would tell you how much money you make, and I'd be pretty close to being right, too, because 70% of the difference between one dentist and another in terms of their income is a result of how well they delegate. Now, I recognize this is a problem uh, because now we're beginning to get delegation of dentist to dentist delegation and some of those dentists aren't too happy about that and we're getting delegation of dentists working for people who aren't dentists and some people are like myself are worried about that so i wrote a little editorial in the journal of the american college of dentists about uh, that practice and i said beware of that but it wasn't much of a, an editorial it didn't do any good uh, you can see that that editorial was written in 1995. Another thing professional service firms can do is to find better customers. Resources like chair time are limited. That means you should use them where you can to maximize the benefit to the patient. Uh, the best customers are repeat customers. And I did uh, a little... Uh, uh, mining on the internet to find out in California what the average uh, income per household is, and it's $62,000, or it was five years ago. Then I looked to see which census tracts in the state of California had a dentist and which ones didn't. And there's quite a few even counties in California that don't have any dentists at all. But the ones that do have dentists, the median household income is $69,000. In other words, dentists know where the better patients are. Um, the third way that uh, professional services firms 
uh, thrive is through the monopoly. And that's the practice acts that say what dentists can do and what other people can't do, uh, lobbying and so forth. You see, dentistry is not a free market uh, profession. It's a highly regulated profession. In fact, it's one of the most regulated uh, businesses we have. And most of those regulations were put in place by dentistry itself. Let's look at disciplined licenses. Now we're getting into some tender area here, but it's an opportunity for, uh, for finding out how to make things better. Approximately a thousand dentists every year across the country have their licenses disciplined. That means that the state says you can't do that anymore. Uh, about 20 times the number are uh, investigated by state investigatory agencies. Uh, formal complaints against uh, dentists are 100 times uh, that. Uh, each state regulates those uh, professional activities differently. But a common denominator is that it's not a lack of ability that leads to a discipline li uh, license. It's the abuse of judgment on the dentist's part. So I looked at 15% uh, of the dental licensures that were uh, disciplined uh, over a period of time in California, North Carolina, Ohio, and Oklahoma. And you can say, now, wait a minute, Chambers. How did you know who had a disciplined license? And the answer is that everyone knows who has a disciplined license. In every state and jurisdiction, it is a law that a disciplined license is posted online for everybody in the state to read. And uh, they, they run into 15, 20 pages, 30 pages of detail about this. And it's, it's, it's not happy reading, but you can read it. The technical issues, about a third of the cases were for technical reasons. Now, uh, this isn't uh, under Phil and it isn't uh, overhangs. It's failure to diagnose and it's performing work uh, for which there's no record that the patient, in fact, needs that work and so forth. The graph, and you'll see a couple more like this, the, uh, the blue bars, the higher the bar, that means the greater the proportion in that age group of dentists who have disciplined licenses for technical reasons. And that's an unusual curve. It's not a normal curve. It's what we call a bimodal curve. And there's a big bump down there in the low end and a little of bump at the high end. And these bumps correspond roughly to when one starts their own personal practice, starting up the practice, and then again, ending the practice just before retirement. The biggest uh, area of concern uh, is uh, patient management. And that, that's where the overtreatment comes in, and that's where it comes in for billing for procedures that weren't done and that sort of stuff. The, the case management, the, the doing the veneers before the, uh, before the perio. Uh, it's a lack of informed consent. It's abandoning patients uh, um, in the middle of treatment. And you can see that, again, there's that bimodal distribution. The beginning of practice, of, of one's own practice, not the beginning of practice of dentistry, and then uh, towards the end. Um, and then there are personal issues. Dentists are a lot like people. And some of them go out and drive their cars when they're drunk, and they shouldn't do that. And some of them uh, take drugs and prescribe drugs for their friends. And some of them are cognitively impaired and don't know for sure what day it is and so forth. Some of them um, in, engage in sexual misconduct. And then there's that famous one about too, many, too few CE hours. And they, they commit crimes like uh, auto theft and so forth. Uh, my favorite was a dentist who impersonated a, uh, an enforcement officer for the Department of Consumer Affairs and sent notes to her colleagues saying, I'm going to come and visit your office and I want to see your charts. Well, she was blocked from practicing for a little while. Um, 
But again, the same bimodal distribution. It, it is not, it is age-related, but not age-related in the way one would normally think. Now that dashed line that goes across in the middle is the proportion of dentists in the United States by age. And you can see there's more young ones and it tapers off as the older ones. Dentistry doesn't kill people, but we're uh, increasing the number of dentists. So the new dentists, of course, are the young dentists. But very importantly, you look at that graph and you can see that um, discipline licenses are underrepresented in the young group. In fact, that's the same that we found when we looked at medicine and other fields. The average age of a discipline license uh, among professionals is about 57. Now, who does that behavior that, should, that they shouldn't? The top line here is an important line because for every discipline dentist I found, I found a matched dentist who was like that person in terms of where they are and how they practice and specialties and so forth. Uh, so we're looking at the ones that don't have a discipline license across the top there, and we can see that they don't have a lot of multiple offices, and they don't have a lot of the fictitious business names. They aren't Dr. Wonderful or Magic Dental Office and that sort of thing. The ones that have technical and management problems do have multiple offices, and they do have fictitious names. And they do treat patients who don't have as much money as the other patients. So there's this thing about, I think the dentists who aren't doing a good job know they're not doing a good job, and they're embarrassed about that, and they hide from their patients, and they hide by going from office to office, and they hide by uh, having a fictitious business name. Um, about 40% of the dentists uh, with fictitious, with uh, discipline licenses were ADA members, but that's not a good number. Uh, the problem is that if you have a discipline license, you'll drop your ADA membership. Or if you don't, the ADA will probably drop you. Now, the next slide I'm going to show you has very little information on it, but it's something I'm quite proud of. I also look to see whether any of the uh, fellows of the American College of Dentists have discipline licenses. And of course, that will include you. So here's the number. Justifiable criticism. The ethicists have said for a long time, it's one of the favorite things they say, is that there's this implied social contract. Now, you can't find it, it isn't written down anywhere, but the idea is that everybody understands that society, because it can't judge the quality of what professionals do, grants a privilege to the profession to regulate themselves in exchange for the promise that the profession will police itself. Now, is this done? I'm not sure. The ADA has an item in the code which addresses that issue. And it says that dentists, all dentists, are always obliged to report gross and continuous faulty treatment and to inform the patient that there is something wrong in their mouth. It does not say that dentists should avoid criticizing their colleagues because they don't know what the conditions were under which the care was provided. It doesn't say that. But in the advisory opinion, which is a, kind of an appendix to the code, it does say that if you're not so sure about how this gross and faulty stuff came to be, you should go and talk to your colleague. And I think that advisory opinion is a very strong statement it doesn't say rat on your colleague. It says, go and talk to your colleague and see if we can make things a little better. Now, the patients in the profession don't see this matter the same way. The curve on the right, the one in blue, is the response of dentists to the question, should you report gross or continuous faulty treatment? 
and the dentist kind of bunch up over in there, no way I'm not going to do that sort of thing. And the patients, and that's the orange line on the left, say, well, of course, I assumed that all the dentists were doing that. Let's talk about the common good, because there is a common good in dentistry, something that dentists share among each uh, themselves. And uh, I can ask, I, let me ask this question. Is ethics an individual thing or a professional issue? And you're going to say, well, no, of course, it's both. And I say, okay, that's true. But you're not going to solve the problem, are you, unless you address the professional issue over and above the individual issue. You have to look to the common good. The way the common good game works, and we've done this in economics and sociology and criminology and all the rest, is that each contributes to the common good. We all do that. We all put in our best or you know, next to best and so forth. And the public sees that and it judges the entire profession, not the individual, but the entire profession. Patients go to dentists because dentistry is good and they know that it's good. So there's a common benefit, a reputation benefit for the whole profession and it's equally distributed among all the members in the profession. Okay, there's a problem there, isn't there? Think about it for a minute. Free riding means that you contribute less than your fair share, but you expect an equal reward. We've done this uh, over and over again. It's all over the literature. I've done it with dentists. I've done it with uh, residents and so forth. It always works the same way. You set up a situation where everybody puts in a little something, a little fake money, or a little uh, uh, report on what they've done for their patients and so forth. Um, and then you uh, magnify that a little bit and give it back to uh, everybody in equal shares. And what we find out is that at the beginning, people put in uh, pretty good amounts, but gradually they look around and they say, wait a minute, I'm not getting what I expect out of this deal. I think somebody else is maybe uh, not doing uh, their fair share, so maybe I shouldn't have to do my fair share either, but I will get the common reward. And what happens over time, and it's usually a very short period of time, is that people stop contributing. That's pretty much every person for himself. That's pretty much that guy in Ohio who said, wait a minute, an ethical problem is that every dentist works for himself. Now, we can fix this problem. It's pretty easy, very predictable. What you do is you say to the person you think who is a free rider, I think you're free riding. I'm going to make it a little tough on you until you put in your fair share. And what happens is that the free riders disappear and that everybody benefits more than they benefited in the first place. Now, I think you realize that Chambers just said something like, you got to punish your colleague for the common good. Well, I didn't quite say that. What I said is that for the good of the profession, you should pay attention to what your colleague is doing and help that colleague be a little better at it. You're not trying to kick the person out of the game. You're trying to show the person how to play the game better. So the common good may not be holding in uh, dentistry. The, uh, the membership in organized dentistry is going down. Uh, we're, uh, we're joining, writing our checks that we're not paying. Uh, we're not participating as much. And you say, well, <laughs> well, of course, that's the way it is. You know, in America is not a joining uh, society anymore. People, people just don't join. And I say, well, that's true for some, and it's not true for others. For example, nurses are not losing membership. Lawyers are not losing membership. 
evangelical churches are gaining membership. What about Amazon Prime? Some organizations are losing and some are holding steady. Um, every year the Gallup company does surveys of the public, it's called the uh, Professional Trust Survey, and they ask one question, do you believe that people in this line of work have your best interests in mind? And they do that every four years for uh, the profession. And you can see in the graph on the left what happens when they uh, survey about nurses and so forth. And the nurses are always on the top. I think the nurses are always going to be the most trusted profession. And physicians are trusted and pharmacists are trusted. But dentistry is the lowest trust among the health profession. So dentists could say, well, yeah, but look, <laughs> we may not be so bad. What's the numbers for lobbyists and members of Congress and PR people and marketers and insurance executives and lawyers? Well, that's on the graph on the right. We wouldn't want to be associated with those kinds of people uh, at all. Um, but as you can see, lawyers are making a run right now. It's, uh, they're on the upswing. Now, the... <laughs> The problem with the dental profession is that it's becoming professionalized. Now, that's a very difficult sentence to unravel. Um, what it means is that um, the profession appeals to dentists, but it isn't run by dentists. Take a look at the morning huddle. That's, uh, you know, I check every, uh, every day, uh, but Sunday, I check the, 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 the huddle to see what the profession is interested in. And the stuff's not written by dentists. It's written by lawyers, PR experts, lobbyists, consultants. It's written by professionals in other professions. So the question is, is dentistry as an organization answering the profession's need for its identity? Or is it answering the profession's needs for services? And the answer is that they pay for lobbying. They offer the members credit cards, CE courses, spot news. They'll sell you insurance and so forth. I was worried about that, so I looked at all of the um, ADA news since it's been published, and I just measured the amount of space devoted to advertising, and the amount of advertising has gone up, and that includes advertising for those outside the profession and advertising for the ADA itself. Uh, send, us, uh, send the ADA money, and we'll send you some uh, new materials and so forth. Uh, so the more advertising, the less membership. But then look at the identity side of things and say, well, how much of the ADA news is devoted to uh, praising uh, the work of uh, dentists and uh, letters to the editor and that sort of thing. And the more of that there is, the higher the, um, the participation. Um, you can see the, the graph on the far right, that's age and proportion of membership. The, uh, the highest membership, of course, is the young group and the, uh, the uh, dental educators. The educators are overrepresented in ADA membership. It doesn't last, of course, because the, the young ones get a discount on their membership and then they, uh, they say, well, the services aren't worth uh, what I'd have to pay in addition to, uh, to get those. So the, there's a difference between recruiting and retaining, and the profession has a retention problem right now. The graph in the upper right-hand corner is ADA membership, 1960 to now. And when I started in dentistry, the proportion of uh, people who says, oh, I'm in organized dentistry, was 94, 95, 96% or something. And now it's down around 65%. Uh, um, I hope you don't think that I'm responsible for that drop. Um, 
Question. Is ethics a matter of character or a matter of situation? So you see, if ethics is a matter of character, it's really easy to fix the problem. You just get rid of the bad apples. And some people said, well, you know, it was uh, the character was uh, determined at uh, grade school and uh, the dental school should just keep those folks out. Here's the problem. If you put all the bad apples out, there wouldn't be many people left. You see, virtually all unethical behavior is performed by people who consider themselves to be basically ethical. Their character, they think, is ethical, but sometimes the situation makes them unethical. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but, you know, there was some pressure, and uh, it was a little ambiguous, and um, no one was really hurt. And um, besides, I do so darn much for everybody all the time. You know, I should get a little, you know, a little credit here. Um, Enron, if you wanted to see a really great ethics statement, Google Enron ethics. It's 42 pages long, and it's excellent. Uh, surveys show that over 90% of Americans say they have committed a felony or misdemeanor. They just haven't been caught. 40% uh, say they tr uh, cheat on their taxes. Two-thirds of Fortune 500 companies uh, have been caught by the federal government, and they're working on that. White collar crime, that would be uh, insurance fraud and over treating patients and so forth, accounts for 25%, 25 times the damage to America as all of the street crime put together. Fraud, internal theft, and so forth. And your practice will be double uh, what you lose due to um, the bad debt. And dental schools do have cheating. There is cheating going on in dental schools. Not as much as in um, nursing or, or uh, law school and uh, those other places. And it's going down in American dental schools. The peak year for uh, cheating in dental school was 1979. Now, priming. We're still on the topic of, is it a matter of character or is it a matter of situation? And of course, it's a matter of both. And we have a technical term in ethics for situational cheating. It's called fudging. And that's uh, giving yourself a little credit uh, because you think you deserve a little credit. And we've studied those things and we find, for example, you give you take students at Harvard and MIT, bright young uh, people, and you give them a little math test and you say, you score this math test and report to us how many you got right and we'll give you a reward. We'll pay you more money if you got a higher uh, score and so forth. But they looked and some of those patients, some of those students, they said, before you take the test, you're going to sign this pledge that you'll agree by the honor code at your school. And some of them, they didn't. And because ethics is situational, those who signed the pledge didn't cheat as much. Well, that's pretty good. The problem is there is no ethics. There is no honor code at Harvard. There is no honor code at MIT. So it's not whether, the, whether it's an honor code. It's a question of whether you think there is an honor code. We do this more commonly by asking people, um, name as many of the tunes that were popular in high school, or name as many as you can of the Ten Commandments before we give them one of these fudge tests. And what we find out repeatedly is that Americans uh, don't know the Ten Commandments. Um, we did this with the American College of Dentists, and at a board meeting, we asked the regents to take a little survey on ethics, and they did. And then we gave them the same survey a couple of months later. And they scored higher on the survey when they were with a group of colleagues who were talking about ethics than when they were individuals. Now, that's something really important. That's a quick way of making sure that people are more ethical. You just put them in situations where they're talking about ethics with their colleagues. So the rule is, whether you expect others to be ethical or not, 
You'll probably be right. Touchstones, ethical touchstones. That's a matter of um, what you're holding in your hands when you're making difficult decisions. Who do you consult? What do you consult when you're deciding whether you should take a legal action against a former associate who's uh, competing at a non-competition clause or violating or discharging a patient who isn't paying his or her um, bills and so forth. And uh, so we surveyed people and uh, about half of them said, well, I'd, I'd like to talk with my colleagues or I'd like to talk with uh, those people who were uh, cheating on me. And that's good. That's excellent. Now, what we see on the over, over there on the right hand side is there's some touchstones that people don't pay that much attention to. So what are they? Well, they're codes and principles and experts. The code and the ethical principles, this non, this, this beneficence and justice and that sort of stuff, just don't carry that much weight practically. Uh, in fact, we surveyed uh, the uh, dentists and found that half of them don't know. Uh, we found that the ones we surveyed only knew half of the ADA code, and some of them simply said, well, I just don't pay any attention to that anyway. And who knows the principles of bioethics? You don't know which ones you're not following, do you? Um, and then the experts. You're going to stay away from the experts. The last thing you're going to want to do is ask a lawyer, or heaven sakes, don't ask an ethicist. They might know the answer. It might be different from what you want, and they have credibility. Now, what do we pay attention to? The answer is we pay attention to ourselves. We consult ourselves. This is that individualism thing coming up again. Um, so the expert is optionable, optional. Uh, this is different in dentistry than it is from other fields. I've looked at uh, uh, journalism and business and some other fields, they don't look at ethics the same way dentists do. Uh, in dentistry, the dentist is the whole game. It starts with whatever the dentist thinks is a problem in his or her own office, not what other people think might be a problem. And the, uh, the dentist considers the options and weighs them and then determines whether the uh, result has been uh, a good one or not. Um, dentists also have the option of dilemmas. Dilemmas aren't, uh, aren't, aren't popular in bioethics or uh, ethics in general or other areas uh, where people, professionals, look at ethics. Uh, a dilemma is a case where it could be one thing or it could be another, and nothing is perfect, but all of them are kind of okay. You just pick the one that you think will work best for you. The Commission on Dental Accreditation um, made a requirement for dental schools in 1997, and it said that all the dental schools have to teach uh, ethics. And so uh, the young dentists are, in fact, uh, a little more knowledgeable about ethics than their uh, seniors were. Um, but the dental school curriculum didn't say, uh, what it said is they have to know about ethics. It didn't say they have to be ethical. Uh, so in dental schools, it's probably not going to make them ethical because there's only 23 hours over the four-year period on average devoted to that. And that number is going down. And in fact, that little graphic on the lower right shows the number of publications on dental ethics, and it's less than half of what it was a decade or so ago. Now, I applaud the ADA for uh, creating an ethics hotline. That's a situation where you could phone in to the ADA anonymously, and you could get some advice from an expert on uh, dental uh, ethics, and they would tell you about what the code says. 
uh, we don't do it anymore. Uh, we stopped doing that. And one of the reasons was that they weren't phoning in with ethical problems. They were phoning in with questions like, can you tell me a good lawyer to, that I can use to get at this uh, guy who's cheating, um, this other guy? Um, also, it wasn't the dentists who were phoning in, it was the patients and the, uh, the staff who were phoning in. And um, surprisingly or disappointingly, uh, no one phoned in and said, uh, how can I be more uh, ethical? What can I do to be more ethical? Uh, so, is ethics an opportunity? Or is ethics an obligation? Is it something you'd be happy to do or something you have to do? And people who've looked at the surveys that we've done and so forth are quick to point out we never asked the dentist whether they were ethical. And that's true, we didn't. Um, asking a person, are you ethical, is not a value question. It's an intelligence test question. Who's going to say, no, I'm not ethical. In fact, I'm probably one of the least ethical people uh, around. Um, this is something called response bias, and on surveys, people tend to give the responses that uh, they think others are looking for. So how do we get at whether dentists think they're ethical? Uh, surprisingly, we use uh, bias as the, as the can opener. We use something called attention bias, and it's well known that um, people pay attention to positive things about what they like and negative things about what they don't like. So if, I, if you told me whether you watch Fox News or uh, CNN, I'd be pretty accurate in guessing whether you voted for a man or a woman in the last presidential election. Um, so what I did was make up fake journal article titles. They were titles like the 10 newest advances in technology, or the public thinks dentists are not treating everyone fairly. So there are positive things and there are negative things, and they're about dentist income, techniques in dentistry, ethics, and health outcomes. And here's what we found. Believe it or not, Income is not the major concern among dentists. It's the second uh, concern, and other uh, surveys have confirmed the same thing. Dentists are primarily concerned about uh, technical quality of dentistry. Dentists like to do dentistry. They would feel better if they took their hands out of the patient's mouth and they looked at that and said, boy, I hope the patient appreciates this crown as much as I do because that is a nice looking crown. They are concerned a little bit about money and they would be happy to get more money. That's, that's, not, a, uh, that's not a problem. The question now is what about ethics and uh, the overall health of the public? That isn't so, that isn't such good news, is it? Uh, not only are those two values lower than the other two, they're a bit negative. Uh, so dentists don't want to go and have someone tell them that they're being unethical. They don't want to read another paper that says, well, there's an access issue. Now, the difference between the ones on the left and the ones on the right is qualitative, not quantitative. Opportunities are values that can be satisfied indefinitely. More is always better. There's always room for more. No dentist would, even though dentists are in the top two or three percent of income earners in this country, no one is saying, well, I got enough, you know, no problem. Um, the items on the right side are obligations, or what we call uh, motivation factors. And that means there's a standard. You have to be up to standard or people will start paying too much attention to you. But if you meet the standard, you don't get extra credit for going beyond uh, the, the standard. So here's the summary. 
practice-centered, ethics-based professional service firms model is being threatened by forces outside of the profession. Now, let me stop for a second. I'm not going to talk like I'm an ethicist or something. I'm going to talk about David Chambers. I think that's terrible. Personally, I believe the professional service firm model is wonderful in terms of uh, of dentistry. It's what dentistry should be based on. It's what dentist. It's what made dentistry a profession that serves the public well. I'm worried that other people are taking a chip and a whack at it. Okay, now I'm back to the to the person presenting the, the presentation. The extent to which the profession is honoring the implied contract to police itself is at this point an open question. Um, organizations are now competing to offer to dentists services and they're retreating from offering dentists help with their professional identity. Ethics is increasingly being seen as situational bargaining rather than character, and that has some good features and it has some bad features. Dentists are still in the position to self-define what it means to be ethically good enough. Dentists still practice individually. And the public sees dentists as technicians. And the profession seems to agree that that's, uh, that's okay. Now, what about approaches, ethical approaches to address some of these issues? I divide them into two categories. There's the me ethics and the we ethics. The ethics of judgment sounds like this. Here is what you should do. And the ethics of justification says, I know I'm right. On the other hand, the we ethics involves the ethics of engagement, and it says, Let's see if we can figure out something here that works better for both of us. Better for both of us. And then the leadership ethics, which says, can I help you be more ethical? The ethics of judgment here are just a couple screenshots I grabbed from a recent uh, ADA news. It says this. Surely everybody, everything would be better if you just did what I think you should do. The problem with that is that it just won't work. Who wants to be told what to do? Huh? Who gets to do the telling? How do we resolve cases of, uh, of conflict between the experts? Now, what usually is the, uh, the, ex, ex, uh, the ethics of judgment is we want somebody else to do something and we're going to use threats and power and economic persuasion and a little deception and so forth to get them to do it. But those all sound so negative, we're going to dress it up, make it sound like it's really ethical what we're asking them to do. Now, that guy on the right is Gary Harden, and the reason he gets to be in these uh, pictures is that he wrote probably the most famous of all uh, essays on this uh, problem it's called The Tragedy of the Commons. And Hardin says, don't count on others to solve your problem, but doing so means acting against their own best interests. Well, I think Hardin's kind of right on that. But what about the ethics of justification? This is the default position. This is what bioethics is based on. This is the principles approach. This is the codes approach. This is the dilemmas approach. It won't work. Naming the problem doesn't solve the problem. Now, when you get to the pearly gates, they're going to give you an entrance exam, and you have to write up, fill out this paper and so forth. And one of the questions is going to be, can you spell non-maleficence? No one's going to be denied admission because they can't spell non-maleficence. Now, do we know what is right? A lot of us know what is right, but we don't do what's right. And what about these conflicting experts? The expert, that's how we get paid, uh, is we disagree with the other experts. Learning French 
and taking a trip down the Dordogne River Valley does not make you a Frenchman. It's a poor mind that can't gen up some excuse for what it wants to do. Now, uh, that was said by William Jennings Bryant. Actually, Bryant won the Scopes trial. Isn't that amazing? Um, okay, let's switch to the we ethics, the ethics of engagement. We can always listen to others, usually to our benefit. We should always be allowed to tell others our side of the story, usually to their benefit. Now, I'm going to read this sentence in red because it's very important. It's the whole summary of the whole presentation. Where competent, reasonably informed, and uncoerced parties, that's you and your patient and your colleagues, exchange views about how they believe the world could be made better, we could be better, there is a mutual strategy that neither party has ethical grounds for wanting to change under the circumstances. That's very important. That's my definition of ethics. Um, so that's the ethics of engagement. It's a process approach. It's how to be ethical. It's not what you think other people should do to be ethical. And the marvelous thing about it is that it requires no enforcement with all the regulations. If you and the insurance company agree that this is the best that both of you can do, then you won't cheat and they won't cheat. So there's no need for enforcement. Now, if that's Chambers' rule for ethics, and there's all these other things, Chambers' corollary is all the other approaches are less ethical. Now, this picture on the right is, uh, is one of my favorites. I got this bookmarked. That guy in the middle is my hero. His name is John Nash. He's dressed up really nice, and the reason is that they just gave him the Nobel Prize. That's pretty neat stuff, you know. And the reason they gave him the Nobel Prize is that he proved. He didn't suggest. He didn't propose. He didn't argue. He proved that the sentence in red on this slide is always correct under all circumstances. Ethics is unavoidable and it's powerful, if you really do uh, ethics. So there's something even better. That's the ethics of leadership. And that's any person in any position who makes it possible for other people to be more ethical. It's the person who befriends another person who's confused, who doesn't know that uh, he or she is really appreciated, but they are. It's the person who offers a little guidance. Did, did, did you see this uh, report about so-and-so? It's the person who role models. It's the person who does the right thing and expects that a few other people will follow him. It's the person who mentors, who finds and trains up uh, his or her replacement. It's the coach. It's the one who can't do it himself anymore, but tells others how to do it. And there's a great coach on the bottom right. That's John Wooden, greatest, one of the greatest coaches of all time. And John Wooden said, the main ingredient of stardom is the rest of the team. I think he's right. And this person is Nolan. This is Nolan. He's two years old. He's having a good time. But if Nolan stood up very quickly now, he might bump his head on the counter and get himself a big ouchie. Now, there's two ethical approaches being illustrated here. One of them is the, is the, uh, is the me ethics, and it says, Nolan, look out. Nolan, be careful. Nolan, watch what you're doing. Or worse yet, Nolan, I told you so, Nolan. The, picture on the right is we ethics. You just set it up so that Nolan is going to do well and you say, hey Nolan, let's have a good time. So what is the new professionalism? Ethics isn't something you say, it's a syntax for how you live your life. It sounds like this. 
I like what you just did. Show me how. Or it sounds like this. This isn't working. Let's talk about it. It's the one minute you add to every patient encounter where you listen to the patient and then write down what they said in the chart. It's joining positive groups, your component society, the Rotary Club, uh, church, synagogue, mosque, um, the book club. It's being around people who are talking to each other about the better world that they could uh, uh, work on. It's first do it and then say what you've done. Now, um, Confucius said that. I'm not kidding. Confucius really did say that's what ethics was. Do the right thing and then say something about it. Um, it's looking for the common good. And incidentally, the common good is self-reinforcing. Um, I don't like that man. Abraham Lincoln said that. A lot of presidents have said, I don't like that man. But Abraham Lincoln said something further. I think I'll have to get to know him better. So let's see what we can find about going together. The world is changing around dentistry. We can't predict and we can't control what will happen. But the quality of the solutions we find will depend on who participates in that conversation and our willingness to listen. The we ethics has the best chance of succeeding. So let me close with a little story. This story was told by a slave in Turkey, 600 BC. Uh, his name was Aesop. And he talked about a, a crow, and the crow was hopping along saying, boy, I'm thirsty, I could sure use a drink. Came across a pitcher, and he looked in, and lo and behold, there was water in the bottom of the pitcher. So he says, you know what, I'm going to use a little me ethics. I'm going to tip that pitcher over. But the trouble was, if he pitched the, tipper, the pitcher over, he tipped it over, the water would run out, and he wouldn't get any. So that isn't going to work. So he says, well, yeah, there's another kind of me ethics. I got a great beak. I got one of the most fancy beaks that is around. I'll just stick my nose down in there and get it. But his beak wasn't long enough. As an individual, he could not change the world. So he says, well, wait a minute. There was this webinar thing that the American College of Dentists did, and Chambers said uh, something about ethics of engagement. I'm going to get some of these rocks here, and I'm going to stick these rocks in the pitcher. And the more rocks the crow put in the pick, pitcher, the higher the water level became, and he eventually drank his fill and then shared that information with his murderer of crows, who were uh, his friends. The moral to the story is very simple. Don't expect to get something out unless you put something in. It's been a privilege sharing this time with you to talk about ethics. Each of you individually is a point of light for dentistry. Together, as we engage those who are outside and don't know what's the right thing, and engage those who are within the profession and don't know the right thing, and work with them the profession will rejoice. Thank you.